right, so welcome back to the discussion of spatial data mining. In the first video, we uh, simply talked about the motivation for spatial data mining, and we saw many, many uh, societal use cases, ranging from public health to public safety. We also uh, tried to informally describe spatial data mining in terms of you know, looking for patterns which are interesting, useful, and non-trivial. And we also gave you examples of many pattern families. Uh, in this video, you know, we are going to look at the input data. So the spatial data that is processed through spatial data mining is, will be covered in this video. When we come back to next video, we will look at statistical foundations. It turns out that the type of statistics used for spatial data is a little bit different than the traditional conventional statistics. And then we'll follow that by exploration of individual pattern families, such as hotspots and so on. Okay. So at the end of the first video, when we have talked about spatial data, uh, we should be able to do three things. You know, first, describe the basic inputs of spatial data mining. In more detail, uh, we can talk about the common spatial data types and operations. And you may again wonder why are we revisiting the data types and operations. We did see a little bit of this in spatial querying anyway. But in context of data mining machine learning statistics, there is an additional motivation, which has to do with feature selection. So when you see this keyword feature selection, then that is one way to process spatial data. So people who are familiar with traditional machine learning statistics data mining and are not aware of any unique techniques that we will discuss, they would often model the special parts of geospatial data in terms of features, such as distance to water. Okay, something you saw in that bird nest prediction case study. Okay. So again, uh, if we know the common spatial data types and operations, then we will have a better choice of these features. So we can go beyond simply distance to water or distance to transportation to include other things, such as overlap and things of that kind. Okay. So without further ado, let's, let's go and look at these data types. Okay. Um, so the first, look at the basic data. So we are all used to non-spatial data, such as numbers and text strings. So if we were modeling cities or countries, we did have some numeric and text attribute, such as name of the country or name of the city. Those are string data types. You can also look at population of a city or a country. Those are numeric data types. But in addition to that, we also model location of the city or the footprint of a city. And those are spatial data types. So when we have attributes which are geographically referenced, such as the location, city center, may be specified by a longitude and latitude, perhaps even by its elevation. So that is a spatial attribute. Same way if we are looking at the extent, the footprint of a city, its outer boundary or a, or a country, those are spatial attributes. Okay? So when we were working with the spatial query languages, we only saw one specific representation of spatial data, what we call vector. But in general, you know, there are more. So in spatial data mining, you are actually going to see you know, three different types of data. Okay? The, the middle one or the vector is something we saw with OGIS data type and we worked with it in spatial querying quite a bit. And here is a map which is showing you a vector map around the campus of University of Minnesota. So here we have a river, you know, roads, you know, little buildings. The buildings are, you know, so, you know, modeled as polygons, roads are modeled at center lines, and so on. Okay? But you, you have also seen satellite imagery. So if you were on Google Earth, you can see the raster version of the same data. So here is University of Minnesota campus from a satellite imagery kind of data set perspective, okay? something like what you will see on Google Earth. And this data set is a bit different. So in raster data set is similar to what you get from your digital camera where you know a, a area is divided into uniform grids so you can imagine columns and rows and then you have pixels so intersection of row and column is a pixel so this entire data set may be composed of 1000 pixels in each row and 1000 columns so maybe there is a million pixel and for each pixel we may specify some value such as elevation or the reflectance and so on okay so these are two very common data types and they are both used in spatial data mining so for example, in satellite imagery, people often start from that and they want to get land cover type. So which areas are forested, which are water, 
And if one can do that for every year, you can start to see the change. You know, is a city growing or is a forest reducing and so on. Okay. Now there is a third data type called graph. In urban areas, we have many transportation network. Okay? So when you use GPS based devices for routing, you are actually using these road maps in a graph format where road intersections may be modeled as nodes and the road segments connecting adjacent intersections may be modeled as edges. And this kind of a format is very helpful for routing and navigation. Okay? All right. Now one unique aspect of spatial data is the relationships. Okay? So let's again talk about relationships across non-spatial and spatial data. So traditionally, if you have used relational databases, you have used the traditional non-spatial relationships and they are always explicit. In fact, your database schema lists a set of relationships and which are being stored in the data set. And that's why we are calling it explicit. So in our own schema for spatial querying, you remember that cities and countries were related by a relationship called capital of. So certain cities were capital of their countries. And this was explicitly stored. Okay? In the table, if you remember, in the city table, there was a column which said capital of, and it had a country, so you were explicitly storing it. Okay? Now contrast this with spatial relationships, such as distance. The city table that we saw, given the city center locations, we could call the OGIS function and compute the distance between cities. Right? However, the distance was not explicitly stored in the table. Okay? And this is very typical of spatial relationships. So these are implicit, but you, know, you can compute it on demand as long as all the locations or geodata are using compatible coordinate systems, such as latitude, longitude. Okay? And there are many of these spatial relationships. So in spatial querying chapter, we saw topological relationships such as you know, two countries' boundaries, they meet, they are neighbors, or a city may be within a country and so on. But you know, there are other relationships such as direction. So people who do navigation, they often look at absolute directions such as north, south, east, west. So for example, you can ask whether the city, you know, Toronto, in which direction is it from a city like Mexico City? Okay? And based on these predicates, you can say roughly north, maybe a little bit to the east and so on. There are metric relationships such as distance, areas, and so on. And if you go to raster data sets, you have other types of relationships which are often categorized into focal, local, and zonal. Okay? So focal relationships takes a location and compares it with the neighborhood. So if you imagine an elevation map given in a raster format, then given the elevation of each you know, cell or pixel in the raster, we can compute the slope. We can ask if you put water on this particular pixel, will it stay there or it will flow down? If it flows down, which direction it will flow down? Okay, so these are called focal relationships because it's comparing a location with their in immediate neighbors. People also define zonal relationships. So given a raster data set and some kind of a zone definition such as country boundary, you can ask for aggregate queries. So let's say I have elevation data for entire world and I have country boundaries defining zones, then I can ask for the highest elevation value for each country. Uh, and that would essentially aggregate elevation data or pixels within each country to compute a statistical aggregate. So there is a rich set of these spatial relationships. They are all implicit. In other words, you know, when you start with a spatial data, you probably do not see any spatial relationship there. And But if you want to add spatial features and use classical data mining model, you can use these rich set of operators. Okay, so distances are very, very popular. People often use distance to transportation or distance to water in order to assess the home value and so on. But you could use other things like this. You can ask for you know, the elevation, you know, the slope and things of that kind. Okay. Now, a uh, quick recall for the vector data type, we did study this OGIS standard. And uh, you know, this provided you six data types, like such as points, lines, strings, polygons, and their collections. It also provided you these operations. Now these operations are very standard. So if you were using a product like you know, Postgres, PostGIS, or you know, other spatial libraries in Oracle and Java, then many of these functions are already provided to you. So if you were using these for your spatial feature selection, then your programming effort is minimal. Okay? In fact, many statistical software such as SAS 
have built a bridge to ESRI GIS software and they will allow you to compute even additional spatial features and bring them back in your statistical in, uh, environment as new features for your statistical model building. Okay? And once your models are built, you can export them back to ESRI or a mapping environment to create maps of your results. Okay? Now, uh, we are going to actually look at a little bit more formal detail of these topological operations. You know, just to give you the sense of the mathematical rigor behind it. This is something we didn't have time for in the spatial query language, but it's good for us to revisit a quick minute. So these topological operations in OGIS, they are built on the basis of a very nice rigorous mathematical framework called topology. Okay? And in this case, you know, they basically you know, use three topological notions. So if you have, a, let's say, a country, Topologically, we can ask for three different things. What's the interior of the country? So these are all the places or locations which are inside the country. What's the boundary of this country? And what's the exterior, things that are outside? So each country, we can have three topological property. Now, if I want to study relationship between two countries, then I can look at the three topological properties of country B, three topological properties of country A, and if I look at all combinations, I'm going to get nine combinations. And for each, we can look at the intersection. And that's what is called nine intersection model. Okay? So here in terms of notation, when you see the superscript zero, that's the interior. So here, this column, we are looking at interior of B. When you see delta, that's boundary. So this is all boundary of B. And minus sign is exterior, this is exterior of B. And same way is interior of A, you know, boundary of A and exterior of A. So if you look at these nine combinations, and in each case we can ask whether they intersect or not, just a Boolean true-false question or zero-one question, that will allow us to formalize this topological property. So for example, here, when I'm looking at disjoint, then here is your nine intersection model. And what it is telling is that the interiors don't intersect, boundaries don't intersect, and interior and boundary don't intersect, and so on. So if you get this answer, then the relationship is disjoint. On the other hand, if I look at a signature of this kind, you notice interiors don't intersect, okay? But boundaries do intersect. Remember, this is the boundary. So interiors don't intersect, but boundaries intersect. And this is the situation when you are saying two countries are neighbors and so on, okay? So again, these relationships are very formally defined. So if you go and use it in PostGIS or Oracle or you know, um, IBM DB2 or any Java libraries, and if you are using OGIS kind of standard operations, your results have very rigorous, meaningful definition, and you can use them to, to do your um, feature selection and use classical data mining model if you would. Okay? But in this course, we'll show you other models which will take into account some of the spatial properties. Okay? So with this, we'll try to wrap up the discussion of spatial data and feature selection. And the main thing is to say that at least today, there is a simple features model from OGC, and that takes you quite far. But in future, things will improve. You know, right now, OGC does not model the directional predicate we talked about. It does not model three-dimensional and visibility relationship. So if you are in an area where the elevation varies and you want to ask what is visible from this building top or what is visible from this particular window in a building, those things are not built into OGIS. And you have to do custom programming, something like computer graphics to do that. Uh, same way if you have spatio-temporal data such as GPS trajectory. Those are not well supported in these standards, and uh, we are going to see new standards and new research in, you know, coming out to give you more you know, um, clean ways or mathematically elegant ways to model this. Okay? So this is as a short discussion of spatial data. Again, in summary, you know, we are going to see many types of spatial data. It could be raster, which is a imagery, just like what you see from your digital camera. This may be collected through a satellite or a UAV and there is plenty of that data. It may be a vector data. So sometimes the satellite data you know, is hand processed and we identify lakes or road boundaries in road center lines and we create vectors, points, lines, polygons. And then finally in urban areas, we also model transportation networks as graphs. And we are going to see all this data as we proceed. And these data sets again have relationships. A unique part of spatial relationship is that they are implicit. So you can compute them. They may not be sitting in your table. Uh, but there are quite a few of those relationships, and that will help you do feature selection. 
So with this, we'll wrap up the discussion of spatial data. Next time when we come back, we'll talk about statistical foundation and what we need to change for mining spatial data. Thank you.